It all started with six German-based Dominican nuns and a bleak little dwelling in the midst of cornfields on the northeast fringe of Adrian, Michigan, that would house a hospital for sick and injured railroad workers. More than a century later, could Siena Heights University be the manifestation of the Peninsula of Promise, prophesied by an Adrian Dominican sister just before her death? Mother Camilla Madden was an amazing woman. She was an immigrant. She came from Ireland when she was still very young. Although the Adrian Dominican sisters worked valiantly to staff the hospital and administer to the needs of the poor and helpless in the community, it was evident that education was the primary mission of the sisters' efforts in Michigan, especially the education of teachers. She was a teacher, she wanted to teach, but she was sent to organize the sisters and run a hospital. Hospital was not really working out. And she said, aha, we should have a school. We should be teaching young girls because here we are in the middle of rural Michigan and there are no opportunities for so many young women. There were obstacles, but Camilla was already pretty comfortable overcoming obstacles. She had found a way to get the bishop on her side when she started St. Joseph Academy, and she felt that the Academy girls and the sisters deserved the opportunity to get a college education. The biggest obstacle was land. It was too close to the railroad on one side, and on the other side it was farmland owned by Farmer Smith. And Farmer Smith did not want to sell his land to the sisters because the St. Joseph Academy girls had been stealing his pears and his peaches and his apples. He said the sisters were to blame and they were not going to buy his property. But Mother Camilla was a schemer as well as a dreamer and she found someone else to buy the property and then sell it to her. Although the sisters now had the land to start a college for teacher education, it would take more than 35 years before St. Joseph College would open its doors. She had devoted sisters who uh, were dedicated to education, and she had academy girls who were graduating but then had nowhere further to go. Although the college started in 1919, classes were taught at the Academy building until 1922. Mother Camilla personally supervised the construction of the first college buildings, Sacred Heart Hall in 1922, and Walsh Hall Auditorium, named in honor of Mother Mary Augustine Walsh. The construction of Sacred Heart Hall and Walsh Hall are one of the great acts of faith in the history of this institution. Sacred Heart Hall was built before we had any students. So in 1922, the doors opened and the college had 29 students, eight lay students and 21 sisters. Now that's building a building on faith. Walsh Hall, later to be known as Sage Union, opened in uh, late 1924, early 1925, and provided music facilities, a gymnasium, and uh, meeting spaces for students. Mother Augustine put in place a commitment to sending her young sisters off to earn PhDs, and that was very unusual uh, at that time, and especially at a college where all of the faculty were women. And the college's enrollment grew quickly. According to the Michigan Catholic, in 1922, St. Joseph had nearly 500 students, the majority of which came from Ohio, Michigan, and Illinois. Mother Augustine died uh, after just 10 years in the office, and so it was left to her successor, Mother Gerald Barry, to implement this program. And in 1934, Mother Gerald sent the first group of sisters off for PhD studies and they formed the core of the PhD educated faculty that 
Siena Heights was known for for decades after that. Mother Gerald Berry, a graduate of the college and part of Mother Augustine's administration, became the college's third president in 1933. She would guide the college for more than two decades. By the fall of 1938, the college had just completed construction of Archangelus and Benacasa Halls, providing for the first real semblance of residential life with dormitories and a dining hall in place, the college was ready to take the next step in its evolution. In the spring of 1939, the college community was summoned by Mother Gerald for a major announcement. I can still see Mother Gerald standing at the railing at the top of the steps in Archangelus Lounge, announcing to the student body that the name of the college was being changed. Not because we loved St. Joseph any less than Catherine of Siena, but because the academy was named St. Joseph and sometimes there was confusion with the college having the same name. I wondered, though, where Mother Gerald got the heights from. I was used to lots of hills in Macon, Georgia, and I thought Adrian was quite flat. The college's name may have changed, but not the strict policies that were in place. A navy blue serge dress with a sailor-type collar served as the student uniform Monday through Saturday. The first dean, Sister Frances Joseph Wright, lived in the dorm with the first college girls and enforced a rigorous daily schedule. Morning prayer at 5.30 a.m., followed by study and breakfast before 7.30 a.m. Mass. While attendance at Mass was not mandatory, the Catholic girls knew that any absence from Mass would be noted and investigated. After a day of classes, study, meals, and three brief recreation periods before night prayer at 8, it was an early bedtime. The academic program at the college did not change a great deal through the whole first 50 years. For many years we had a very strong two-year secretarial program. The sisters wanted to make it possible for their graduates to have careers and to support themselves and that is one of the ways they could do that. By the 1940s, Siena Heights had developed a reputation for academic excellence. Enrollment was strong, and sisters were optimistic about the future. In the spring of 1941, faculty member Sister Mary George Nolan planted two magnolia seedlings on each side of the entrance to Benacasa Hall. However, that optimism on campus turned into concern with America's entrance into World War II. Part of the daily regimen now included preparing for possible air raids and worrying about those loved ones overseas. The war ended and Siena Heights continued to thrive. In the fall of 1955, the freshman class was so large that a room in the basement of Walsh Hall behind the gym was outfitted as a dorm. The college leaned on the reputation of its outstanding faculty, many of whom now were considered legends walking around campus. In the 1950s, founding faculty member Sister Bertha Hominger was renowned as the register who knew you by transcript as well as by name. Sister Regina Marie Lalonde Another founding faculty member developed the Cutting Edge Language Lab and taught several different languages. Then there was art with Sister Janine Clem, theater with Sister Leonetta Bellage, and of course chemistry with Sister Miriam Michael Stinson. Miriam was a wonderful teacher. I used to say that the chairs in the lecture hall could speak chemistry if those kids taking exams would just listen carefully. Miriam's goal, she said, and any teacher's goal, 
she said, should be to make your students be better than you are. And I think she meant it. The president who followed Mother Gerald was Sister Benedicta Marie Ledwidge. In 1960, she was asked, what do you think is a flaw in the American education system at the moment? And she said, well, really, we have failed to recognize that we are moving out of the jet age and into the space age. She knew exactly what was happening and where things were going and where we needed to be going. Sister Benedicta Marie Ludwig was appointed president in 1957. She oversaw the completion of a new library and science wing on campus, and also the construction of Lumen Ecclesiae Chapel, later renamed St. Dominic Chapel. Benedicta Marie stepped down from the presidency because of ill health. And her successor was Sister Petronilla Francoeur. Assuming the presidency in 1965, Sister Mary Petronella Francoeur immediately began plans for expansion and growth of Siena Heights College. In 1968, she oversaw the dedication of Ledwidge Hall, named in honor of Sister Benedicta Marie. Well, everything was changing in the 60s. Music was changing, fashion was changing. The faculty at Siena Heights began to have more and more professors who were men, who were non-vowed women, and it was change. Sister Petronilla had the shortest presidency but in those four years, from 1965 to 1969, she ushered the college into the era of coeducation, lay administration, and into the modern era. She was the president during the 60s, and she set the stage for the future of Siena Heights. During her administration, the art department outgrew its quarters on the fifth floor of Sacred Heart Hall and in 1969, moved to the newly constructed Studio Angelico. Sister Janine Clem was very central to the development of that building. She helped with the fundraising, she helped with the designing, she recruited her students to do the moving of things over to that building. And then shortly after that, Francoeur Theater was built. That building was named to honor Sister Petronella Francoeur. It became the heart of the larger Verheiden Performing Arts Center. Later that decade, after careful study, the Board of Trustees decided to allow male students to earn undergraduate degrees at Siena Heights College. Starting in 1971, we had men actually living in the dorms. That was when we had the Dirty Dozen living in one hall of Archangelus. With the advent of male students, also came talk of starting more programs to engage students on campus. One of those initiatives was intercollegiate athletics. The first intercollegiate sport at Siena Heights was baseball, which took the field in 1973. Originally named the Cannonballers, Indifference and legendary faculty member and athletic advocate Sister Ann Joachim's work with the Wabash Cannonball. New athletic director Harvey Jackson ushered in the Saints nickname, as well as the school colors, blue and yellow. The 70s was really the period of great tumult. And it's hard to believe that the college could suddenly be faced with serious economic problems. Hugh Thompson was our first non-sister, non-female 
non-Catholic president. He was not always liked, but by gum, he got us into the new world. In 1975, Siena Heights began an off-campus degree completion program in Southfield to meet the educational needs of working adults in the Detroit metropolitan area. He was very interested in establishing a way that Siena Heights could offer people in the working world a way to get a college degree. The emergence in the mid-70s of the Bachelor of Applied Science degree probably best could be seen as a program that was going to meet the needs of practicing professionals in a variety of technical, allied health, public safety, and specialized occupational areas. However, the idea of offering a degree for working adults was not without its detractors. Now, some on campus were very threatened by this and thought that Thompson was trying to turn Siena Heights into a community college. He began adding things that were more community college kinds of programs like uh, fashion merchandising, culinary art, and he grew the business program, which of course challenged the liberal arts faculty to some extent. That was the tension that existed that may have been a very good tension. There was talk at that time that maybe Lenawee County needed a community college. To ward that off, he felt that we probably needed to serve the community and offer some of the kinds of programs that community colleges uh, would be offering, he actually came up, some in conjunction with the local vocational technical high school, 12 to 14 associate degree programs. The concept of academic institution becoming partners in degree completion was another concept Siena Heights developed. We began to develop relationships with community colleges once we opened a permanent center in Metro Detroit. Siena Heights opened its first non-Adrian location at a former elementary school building in Southfield, simply known as Magnolia. A couple of years later, Siena Heights took its concept to junior and community colleges opening its first degree completion center at Benton Harbor's Lake Michigan College and later at two-year colleges throughout Michigan. Siena Heights continued to expand its reach outside of Adrian when new president Dr. Lou Vaccaro started as president in 1977. He oversaw the construction of the Siena Heights Activity Center in 1978. This facility, later renamed the Fieldhouse, allowed great growth in the athletic department. Lou Vaccaro arrived with an outgoing personality and a big smile, and he was a, a nice change for Siena. When he came to Siena Heights, he immediately began to expand the student recruitment effort in many ways, but especially in the international realm. What Lou really brought to Siena that has endured is an interest in internationalism. Now with a growing male enrollment and a new focus on educating adult professional students, Siena Heights was a much different institution than in the days of Mother Gerald Berry and the all-female student body. The Adrian campus saw the additional growth of athletic programs, and with it, the emergence of one of Siena's most famous sons, head men's basketball coach, Ben Braun. It was my first month on the, on the job. I had to go up in the dorms and recruit players. Anybody who was over six foot tall, I said, Let, let's give it a shot. I feel that every, every team I coached was a Hall of Fame caliber team, meaning they were not just great players, but they were great kids, and they were, they were great citizens. Uh, they learn so much, they develop uh, as people. I think somebody once said a long time ago, you know, Coach, how's your team going to be? And I said, you know, I don't know. Ask me in 20 years. And so here we are, 20 plus years away, and all the players that I've coached are now here. They're very successful. That makes me feel good as their coach, and it should make all the people who are, had a lot to do with their development feel good about their development. So I was very fortunate we had good players, but then we were able to go out and recruit, and that actually made, you know, helped us enhance our program. But uh, the program took off, and my biggest recruit, I have to, no disappointment to the other guys that I've that have played for me, but I always say my biggest recruit was Fred Smith. To get Fred to go from the admissions department here as my assistant might have been the best recruiting coup I ever pulled off. There were many voices that represented Sienna Heights over the years. 
But none was louder than Fred Smith's. Arriving in July of 1976 as a recent college graduate, Smith accepted a job at Siena Heights admissions office. But it wasn't long before he found his way to coaching and athletics, where he spent the next four plus decades building the Saints athletic program. During his tenure, Siena Heights was one of the winningest small school programs in the country. The Saints recorded five 30-win seasons, 12 appearances in the NAIA National Tournament, and eight WAC titles. It was such a unique place. It was so strong in the performing and visual arts, teacher ed, and obviously the business and the off-campus program was just beginning. But in athletics, it allowed us to reach out to another level of students, just like football has. You know, we're getting student athletes from different high schools now that reach out and then they go, wow, Stan's a pretty great place. And when they got here, they started here maybe as a baseball guy or a, a cross country or basketball player. Athletics just kind of got them interested. They had a chance to play, they liked what they heard, but once they got here, after the first year, especially got here the first year, they loved the commitment of our faculty, their ability to uh, have a life and a career and make a difference at a school. There were changes emerging from the academic side as well. Enrollment of the Adrian campus in the 1979-80 year totaled 1,500 students and included new students from 11 U.S. states, Puerto Rico, and 16 other countries. The 80s was an era of big hair and big fashion, and during that time, Siena was establishing itself in many ways. After President Vaccaro, Kathleen Real, stepped into the presidency, she brought a kind of grace to the office that the men had perhaps not had. The faculty had names like Sister Eileen Rice to teach education. Eileen Rice was really a legend in her own time. She shaped the education department, both undergraduate and graduate. She managed to be president of the Alumni Association at the same time that she was working in education and assisting the dean. And she would, went to every athletic event and would sit in the stands cheering when everyone else was cheering. She was grading papers and she was reading books and she was talking to whoever was next to her. She was a remarkable woman and how she was able to accomplish all those things, I don't know. I think she was the modern version of that original dedicated sister faculty who did it all. At a growing network of degree completion centers, Siena welcomed an eager population of non-traditional students in their 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s and older. But non-trads did not enroll only at satellite sites, they came to Adrian too. Sister Kathleen Real, she worked with the students and the faculty trying to come up with ways that our curriculum could become more reflective of a diverse society and our faculty and staff. Now that was a challenge at that time, it remains a challenge today, but she really uh, was the person who initiated a lot of movement in that area. When Dr. Richard Artman assumed the presidency in August of 1994, he immediately focused on Siena's Catholic identity. Under his leadership, Siena Heights revised its mission statement, which since the 1970s had held no mention of religion. And across the campus there was an awareness that through all the changes that had occurred in the 60s and 70s and 80s, we needed to take steps to ensure that our Adrian Dominican heritage was not one of the things that we were going to lose. Artman, who ushered in the era of betterment, made one of the more visible changes to Siena Heights during his tenure. On July 1, 1998, Siena Heights College officially became Siena Heights University. This is a high moment among benchmarks of the institution. As many of you know, we were founded in 1919 by the Adrian Dominican Sisters. And in 1939, we changed our name to Siena Heights College to differentiate ourselves from St. Joseph's Academy. We were St. Joseph's College at that time. Another important benchmark was 1968 with the admission of men. 
1975, we established the first degree completion program for working adults in Michigan. So I would ask you to count down with me for the unveiling of the sign. Five, four, three, two, one. Sister Marion Michael Stimson, OP, 36, unveiled the new sign. Siena Heights then became a university comprised of three colleges. We had the College of Arts and Sciences, which was the undergraduate program on the main campus. We had the College for Professional Studies, which was all of our degree completion programs off campus. And we had the Graduate College. Now during Rick's time, CPS thrived tremendously and we were educating working adults all across the state. But there was also a move to start thinking about online education. In 2000, Siena Heights offered its first five online courses through the Metropolitan Detroit program in Southfield under the leadership of Buckwas. The university introduced blended online courses that began and ended with in-person meetings, but relied on web-based interaction in between. Some were skeptical, but the immediate success of those classes led Siena to move confidently in the direction of online education. When Deb Carter succeeded Buckwaz as dean, she pledged that off-campus programs would continually seek new and better ways to meet the needs of adult learners. Online education was just one of those ways. No one yet knew how dramatically it would impact the university. Siena Heights was now on the cutting edge of higher education once again. When President Artman announced he was leaving in the fall of 2005, the university began the search for its first new president in more than 11 years. I knew a little bit about Siena before I became president because I was on the board of trustees. It was a wonderful community of people. I was very fortunate to be with such good people. I was anxious to get here when the call came out. Sister Mary Margaret Albert was the unanimous choice. Spending many years in the administration of Siena's sister institution, Barry University in Miami Shores, Florida, Sister Peg arrived on campus in July 2006 with the theme, Be Bold, Think Higher. When we hired Sister Peg Albert, I was thrilled. And the campus rapidly was thrilled. She came on campus and what a surprise, she started hugging everyone. The philosophy was really to get to know the community first before I did anything. And to get to know the university better, where it had been, and where I and my team felt it needed to go. And so the first year was more listening and learning, and then the second year more stepping into action and doing some things that we needed to do. Siena Heights was soon making some very bold decisions. First, the decision was made to start a nursing program. Then came a decision that some thought would never be made at Siena Heights, a football program. Fred Smith came to see me and said that if we were ever going to start football, now was the time to do so because we had an excellent potential coach, Jim Lyle. And Jim and I met, and I was convinced after those meetings that that he really understood our mission and wanted to live our mission. After more than 42 years representing Siena Heights Athletic as coach and administrator, including the last 36 as athletic director, Smith retired on June 30th, 2019. And I think what Siena has done very well and what we've done is we've kept up with the times and we've given opportunities. Our student athletes are you know, they're graduating, they're, uh, we're not having a hard time recruiting, certainly we're bringing in almost 300 student athletes a year. Uh, so I think we're in good shape. Nursing prompted a significant boost in student interest in all the sciences at Siena. Football led to marching band, an expanded music department, varsity cheer and dance teams, and significant athletic facility improvements. More importantly, it led to the Adrian Campus enrollment gains, which was sorely needed. I think the most difficult thing for me is not being able to do everything I'd like to do in the timeline I'd like to do it, 
because you're limited with time and resources. But people believe in our mission and how we can help students achieve their dreams. I always say we're small enough to meet our students' needs, but large enough to meet their dreams. An outdoor performance stadium provided an instant upgrade to the Saints track and field, soccer and lacrosse programs. When we had at homecoming the first football game, when the students were all there, I mean the stadium was packed, the Adrian Dominican sisters were there marching in. I felt like that was a glimpse of heaven. It was beautiful. And I get teary-eyed just thinking about it a little because it was so moving. And many people said that to me. They felt a spirit there that they had never felt before. Other bold decisions included developing new majors like engineering and theatrical design, expanding athletics with bowling, lacrosse, and eventually esports and reshaping the campus with new facilities, including the McLaughlin University Center and the Spencer Performing Arts Center. We are changing, we are growing, but we are not altering who we are. And as long as that continues, as long as that Adrian Dominican heart beats at this university, I think we will be in wonderful shape. To deepen the community's understanding of the Dominican charism, Sister Peg helped launch the Heritage Project in 2015, a program that touches everyone at Siena. Students explore Dominican themes through the Liberal Arts Corps. Employees participate in activities that highlight Dominican thought, and faculty and staff volunteers participate in the Torchbearer Program. Being an Adrian Dominican sister, and also combined with the mission of Siena, gives my life great meaning. We stand on the shoulders of great, great women. They were the ones who founded this institution and didn't have much monetary uh, means when they did it. They knew it was important. They took a risk. They were bold. They thought higher. I never forget what those sisters went through in the earlier days and, and in the development of Siena. There have been quite a few sisters who have really made their mark here at Siena. Off the Adrian campus, Siena Heights awarded its first degree to a totally online graduate in 2005. Five years later, the number of online graduates had increased to 125. By 2015, 195 online graduates received diplomas. But not everything is about expansion. In 2018, Alumni and administrators alike mourn the loss of the Sage Union, previously known as Walsh Hall. The beautiful Tuscan Romanesque brick building, beloved by many generations, had become at last not only outdated, but irredeemable. To be a Dominican University it means to be a community of prayer, study, service or preaching, and community. I think Siena checks all the boxes. A Dominican uh, community or university should be one of great joy. One of the hallmarks of Dominican life is joy. And so I hope we're a community of great joy, and I know that we are. Today, Siena Heights boasts more than 2,400 students and has survived the test of time. I like to think sometimes about Mother Camilla and what she might say if she came to commencement today. I think she would probably shake her head and smile to see what has happened with the growth of this university and our serving of students of all ages, in all places, in all ways. It's the same no matter where you go. You get the Dominican spirit and a top quality education, and I think Camilla would be proud. Siena Heights moves into the future, still enriched by our mission and values, still inspired by the courage and commitment of the Adrian Dominican sisters. I am very hopeful about the future of Siena Heights University and uh, the next hundred years. But I think if we hold steady to our values, those things that we cherish, and yet move along with the times, the mission of Siena won't change. So I, I think that as we move toward the future, I'm very hopeful that our faculty and staff can meet the needs of our future students, but we have to always prepare ourselves 
in order to be able to do that. All of us need to come back together to celebrate who we were, who we are, and who we're going to be in the future. And that gives me great, great hope.